Now we are live on YouTube, so I will already start by introducing. And meanwhile, some people can sneak in at the last moment. So very happy to uh, be here for another episode of FSR Insights. Um, this time, as you know, we always start from a researcher. This time, Tim is the FSR researcher, and he still looks okay. He told me he was getting vaccinated yesterday, so... He... <laughs> this evening, this evening. This evening, okay, so we got lucky. We, we still have Tim pre-vaccination, uh, still, still, still smiling. Um, so Tim will give a presentation uh, today, and then we have uh, three academic discussants. We have two economists, one from the US, Lynn, and one from the UK, uh, Michael. So Lynn is affiliated with uh, Carnegie Mellon and Michael with Cambridge. Uh, you probably already know them because they are following electricity markets for a while. They have produced a lot of academic work on the topic. So I'm very curious to see what they think of the ongoing work of Tim. Now, why specifically Michael and Lynn today? Well, Tim is going to present a, a draft article that he will sub, uh, submit also to the special issue that Michael, Lynn and me are co-editing with Energies. So this is also a, remi a reminder to anyone that wants to be part of that special issue. Uh, you can still join us. Then we also have Xenia. So Xenia, if you talk about electricity markets, it's good to have a few economists around the table, but it's also good to have an engineer. So Xenia is an engineer uh, by background, and uh, she also works um, at the university. So she's connected with Delft and with the Austrian Institute of Technology. And why Xenia? Well, we discovered her at one of our young researcher seminars in Florence, where you, she clearly stood out with her work on balancing markets and we said, let's keep in touch. So every time we have an excuse, um, we call Xenia. <laughs> uh, let's get started. So everyone you know, that follows these uh, episodes knows that you can put questions in the Q&A box, in the chat box. We have some polls prepared uh, at the end of Tim's presentation to kick off the discussion, but don't hesitate to interact with us um, you know, during the polls, after the polls. Go ahead, uh, Tim. You can start with your presentation. Okay, I'm gonna share the slides. Should be on full screen mode. Okay, perfect. So hello everybody, thank you for, for joining us today and thank you also for our wonderful, wonderful panel to be here today. Leonardo already introduced this special issue of, of energies. I also put the link in, in the chat box if you're interested in submitting your paper or following it up. So the work I, I will be presenting today is about uh, new entrants into electricity markets. So uh, in, this, in this work, we actually take a bit of a historical perspective and then we also look ahead in the future. So we organized this research in different phases. So we identified different phases where we have new entrants entering electricity markets. We are mostly focused on the European case and mostly focused first on a bit wholesale, but then also more on balancing. Um, so with every phase or with every wave of new entrants, of course, regulation uh, had to be uh, adapted or changed because sometimes often justified rules which were in place at a certain point in time with a certain technology mix or a certain, let's say, environment, um, they were justified at a certain point, but then when you move along through the years, they can become, uh, by accident, almost by accident, obstacles for these new entrants. So uh, we discuss in each phase a bit like what are the new entrants and what is and how regulation had to be adapted. So the first phase uh, is located uh, in terms of time at the early days of, of liberalization. And, and one of the issues was that uh, when you liberalize, uh, we're talking about wholesale markets, uh, how to create competition. And there, there were many ways to do so. And one way that was deemed very important in the European case was to open your borders. So actually the first new entrants were the entrants from across the border. So by increasing the market, the relevant market size, you had this, this new entrance. And I think that today we can say that, that Europe is really um, maybe most advanced in the world in terms of uh, integrating its, its wholesale markets and also intraday markets and soon balancing markets. So across different formerly uh, more national markets. So what you can see on the slide 
is how this actually evolved, how more and more countries were coupled and how the way that they were coupled or the way that transmission capacity between the borders was allocated, I would say improved over the years. So the first uh, picture is from 2004. It's from a report from ETSO. ETSO is uh, the, the predecessor of ENSOE, which we know today. And there you can see on how the transmission capacity between the different countries was allocated in many different ways. Some of those, let's say more administrative ways, others more uh, market-based ways. And you can see many colors on the graph and having many colors is not a good sign uh, in, in, in that context. So looking then at the middle uh, graph, so three years later uh, from a report from ERGEC, which is the predecessor of, I think, SEER as we know it today. So the Council of European uh, Regulators, you can see that there are already less colors. And also if you would read the, the manual, you can see that the two ways of allocating capacity uh, were dominated. It's two market-based ways. So explicit allocation and implicit allocation of transmission rights. And if we go to today, the last slide, you can see that we only have one color excluding uh, Norway, but even though they are coupled, it's just because of a different uh, legal status, um, that they are all coupled and they're all coupled via implicit allocation. So the transmission capacity between the bidding zones are allocated via the market algorithm. On this, uh, on this graph, this last graph, you see that GB is still green. Unfortunately, since I think the 1st of January this year, uh, we will have to color it in another color, I assume gray or something in the middle. Uh, this is uh, a bit unfortunate because they take one step back in the way that they are coupled. But this is how we identify this first uh, wave of, of new entrants. So the entrance across, from across the borders. Now, the second wave, they came along with uh, having this 2020 targets in Europe. Of course, uh, we, we gave, uh, we invested a lot in renewables, a lot of, of public money in, in renewables to have, um, yeah, to, to increase their share in the electricity generation mix. And we also uh, tried to enable industrial demand response. Now, having these new players in the market um, made us realize that we had to, to change the way products were designed and also how ex actually the market was designed. At the same time, in, in order to let these new resources compete, at the same time, when you enter a market and you are competing, you get certain rights, but of course you also have certain obligations and obligations in electricity markets, meaning that at the end of the day, you have to be balanced. You have to uh, fulfill your, 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 let's say, your, your financial position with a physical position. And this is called the imbalance settlement me mechanism. And that also had to be changed in order not to create risk risks or too much risks for these new players. So when we're talking about barriers, barriers to participate in markets, we're talking about minimum bid sizes, uh, the duration of the contracts. So whether we play with hourly contracts, whether we play in balancing with, for example, yearly contracts, you can imagine that the shorter the contract, the easier it is for renewables to forecast whether they can compete and similar for demand response. We talk about more technical parameters within balancing, whether you have to be contracted uh, in the balancing capacity market in order to compete in real time, whether you have to be able to provide both upwards and downwards uh, reserves in real time, which used to be bundled, but is now, let's say you can or give upwards or downwards. So all of these kind of technical parameters had to be changed. Also in order to lower the risk for high imbalance penalties, we had to have a, a further developed intraday markets to, to make intraday markets close closer to real time to be able to trade out these imbalances. Also the way that imbalance penalties or imbalance prices, because we prefer to call them prices and not penalties were calculated had to be changed. So actually there has been a lot of research and we can say that at least in Europe, most of these things have been settled with the electricity balancing guideline, which came into force, I think it was 2006, 17 or 18, uh, but at least a couple of years ago, and which is currently being implemented. I would say it's think its final implementation is in a year or two. There are certain exceptions and exemptions, but overall we can say that many of these issues have been, been settled. So now over to the third wave. The third wave are software companies acting as intermediates, so-called asset light companies. These often or sometimes come even out of the telecom industry or the ICT industry. 
And what they actually do is they, they contract with, with flexible, often smaller resources in, under, in order to bundle them together and send, sell these bundles of energy or capacity or let's say flexibility in different electricity markets. So you can see on the slide uh, the names of some of these companies which you might, might recognize. So of course, again, market design and, and product design had to change. For example, it had to be allowed to bid aggregated resources in the market, which is currently in most markets the case. Then also, for example, in terms of pre-qualification, if you have to pre-qualify every little asset, it might be just too costly to, to compete. So therefore, there might be other ways to make sure that these uh, participants are actually fit to, to enter this market. Also in terms of communication standards, because you can imagine such a kind of a software company, it's all about communication and smart technology. If these standards are not harmonized in, in different countries, you can imagine that it's a burden for, for some of these companies which are active across uh, different mar markets, uh, uh, different countries or different markets. So this is also a very active, um, I would say research area currently and also in the last years. One of the major issues that popped up with the, especially the rise of the independent aggregator, which is a company that contracts with consumers, but it's not the supplier of the consumer, has been its relationship with a traditional supplier. And actually that relationship has not been settled in, in the clean energy package, it's been left open. And one of the major issues is that an independent aggregator, when it contracts with consumers of a third of another supplier, another company, it actually impacts by triggering flexibility from these consumers, it impacts the revenues of that traditional supplier. I mean, the revenues would be different if that independent aggregator would have not been there. So the question is whether, there, there are several questions, but an important question is whether if an independent aggregator acts, um, acts on behalf of consumers which are contracted with another supplier, whether this independent aggregator has to compensate uh, the supplier for the foregone revenues. And as you can see from the slide, um, different parts of the world are, are having different answers to this question. And in, in Europe, uh, most of the countries which are currently uh, transposing the electricity directive into their national re uh, legislation or regulation, um, they're actually choosing to, to do, uh, to, to implement a sort of a compensation mechanism for the supplier, but the way they do it is very different. So the way they calculate the compensation, how the compensation or who actually pays the compensation. And you can also see that in different countries, actually different methods are applied. So in some countries you can choose which method you want to apply. In other countries, it depends on the type of voltage level you're talking about or the type of hardware you have in place. So this is currently a very much of an interesting uh, research topic and it is also very relevant in practice because decisions are being made today on how to deal with this issue, which could uh, foster or impede uh, the thriving of these independent aggregators and thus demand response. Now, the last phase is the phase where we now see, very, since very, very recently, smart device uh, companies or hardware companies also acting as not only selling you the car or the heat pump or the batteries, but they also offer you a supply contract. And in that supply contract, they also tell you that you get a beneficial rate if you allow us to sometimes use your, your equipment in order for us to be that aggregator and to act on your behalf into the electricity market. So it's a company which is both the smart device supplier it is the uh, smart device seller, I'm sorry, and producer. And it is also the supplier, electricity supplier, and it is also the aggregator. So these three functions are being bundled. We see this happening with Tesla in, in, in UK. And we see this also happening uh, with Sonnen. In, uh, Sonnen is a battery company uh, in, in Germany. So this is very interesting. I mean, I think we are all happy that their company is really engaging with consumers in order to, let's say, unlock that uh, flexibility at, at the lowest voltage level. But at the same time, by having these companies really integrating these different, let's say, um, functions or roles, you could also think that there might be issues with the sort of a lock-in effect or, or like these supply or these companies which then have priority over your data and so on, and then somehow the leveling playing field 
with other, uh, for example, independent aggregators or suppliers might be, might be distorted. So these are the four phases as we see them in this research. This is ongoing. And finally, in the paper, we will also describe them, of course, more in depth than I just uh, introduced or kicked off the debate uh, today. I think, uh, Leo, it's over to you for the first uh, poll. Thank you, Tim, for the intro. And as you can notice from Tim's intro, it's what we are doing is a bit of a synthesis. And you could already see uh, our panelists popping up uh, in the academic papers we were referring to. Uh, but before we ask them what they think, I would all invite you to vote here because we have two polling questions. And the first one is on who of these players do you think will really make the difference? Of course, you might think that they all will play a role. But if I force you to choose one of them, who will really, you know, large scale be able to tap into demand response at residential level? Um, do you think it is the traditional intermediaries, the retailers, utilities uh, that have always been there? Or is it one of these new intermediaries, independent aggregators, energy communities, or these new smart device suppliers like Tesla um, that Tim was referring to? Or do you think it's really us? We will get active ourselves and we will figure out and we will all become energy experts, prosumers um, that will start to trade our energy. Okay, so a bit spread with a small victory for the smart device uh, suppliers, uh, uh, while most of us think that we are too lazy to do it ourselves. That's a clear loser, but all the others are still in the game. <laughs> so, Lynn, are you ready? Because we have to say to the audience that you did us the biggest favor of all by waking up quite early because you're in a not so favorable time zone. So <laughs> maybe we should also Thank give you. you the opportunity to start here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Leo. Um, how's my audio? Still good? Perfect. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised by the results of that poll. Um, and I'm also... Uh, well, I've, several things, but first, uh, thanks, Tim, for the summary of what I think is some, a very interesting field of research. And I think the, uh, from the U.S. perspective, it's really illuminating to learn about what's going on in Europe because in the U.S., uh, things are proceeding very differently. And, and so it's kind of heartening. And I'm hoping that we can, uh, through the um, special issue of energies that Leo and Michael and I are co-editing, I'm hoping that we can bring together a set of, um, of field experiments, you know, policy experiments, technology experiments to communicate to a broad international audience. Uh, and it, in the U.S., it's, it's challenging. I mean, Tim, the, the first thing you said was, uh, you know, kind of round one was... Uh, bringing in entrants from outside the country. Uh, so within EU, but outside the country. And um, yeah, we, we have that challenge in the US as well, because um, as I'm sure most of you all know, the US has a, a split regulatory jurisdiction where the um, jurisdiction over the retail delivery and sale of electricity is at the state level. And so we have 51 different regulators in the U.S. of that, and they have exclusive uh, they they have exclusive territories, if you will, and the utilities they regulate have exclusive territories. Um, and so it, it, that, that's good news and bad news. You know, I don't want don't take that as just a you know the U.S. is doing it wrong. Um, I think the good news about that is that we have an environment that's ripe for a lot of different experiments. And, uh, and, um, but I do think that, that we are um, definitely not as far along that path as you are uh, in the EU. Um, the, uh, and I, I think the, um, uh, sorry, morning brain is kicking in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the thing that's interesting about the poll result that it's the, the smart device, you know, one of the things that I think we've become accustomed to through our increasingly digital lives is that um, devices, right, devices come to us with a set of capabilities. 
-hmm. and we have set certain expectations for what those capabilities are going to be. And, uh, and increasingly that's going to extend to thermostats, to electric vehicle chargers, to um, PV inverters, to home energy management systems, that we are gonna have sets of expectations for how those devices are gonna come programmed to us. And so I think one of the things that's important is the, um, the user interface and some attention to the user interface and, um, and some entrepreneurial questions about what what can we do with our devices to ensure that uh, they give, give consumers opportunities to engage with their energy consumption and production in ways that, that they find meaningful and that they find valuable. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's gonna be increasingly heterogeneous. Uh, you know, they, historically it's, I flip the switch and the light goes on. Uh, not much engagement there, but now, you know, between the, the range of different potential devices that we'll all be able to consume and produce energy with. Um, and then uh, as well, one of the things that I think is, is really meaningful and valuable about the technological innovations that we've seen, both in distributed resources and in the digitization of, of the grid, is how that um, digitization reduces transaction costs. You know, so I come from, uh, and this is an area where I have some overlap with uh, Jean-Michel Glachon, where you know come from more of an institutional and organizational economics perspective. And so if you think about technological change as reducing the transaction costs that enable parties to exchange, um, and that's certainly one way you can interpret the, the, um, the the narrative that Tim presented as a summary of the research, uh, I think what you're going to see is more opportunities for consumers to express their very diverse preferences. Whereas before in the kind of monopoly, I flip the switch and the light goes on world, um, we may have had underlying potential preferences, but there was no, there was no, uh, product or service available to enable us to express those values. Um, Thank so you, I think I'll stop there for now. Yeah. <laughs> so you can live with the majority vote for the smart devices and you have equally high expectations uh, <laughs> from these devices. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who wants to go next? Next, I'm looking at Michael, Xenia, go ahead, Michael. Um, well, I, great pleasure to be here and um, and uh, be working with uh, Leo and Lynn on our special issue. And um, thanks to Tim for um, presenting his uh, research. Um, yeah, I, I think as an economist, one always wants to inject a note of realism. Um, uh, you know, people currently, people in the UK um, currently spend two and a half euros a day on electricity. Um, so something which saves them 10% of their electricity bill really doesn't register. And, and, um, and it's important to sort of keep, keep the numbers in mind and to just say how challenging some of these new business models really are. You know, um, taking aggregation down into, the, in, into individual households. We're in, an, we're in a period of experimentation at the moment and there are lots of interesting startups around and there's lots of subsidized experiments, which we hope to document some of in our special issue, where, uh, where actually either taxpayers or bill payers are actually subsidizing these platforms and the adoption of, um, of, 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 of particular um, bits of software. But actually the evidence on whether this really yields benefits is pretty thin. Um, for final customers and whether customers will really be interested in the sorts of in the amounts of money at stake um, and, and whether there's really much margin left um, uh, is, is I think a very big question. Um, yes, that might change with an electric vehicle, might change with um, switch to electric heating. Um, but of course, you know, what people want is they want energy they don't notice. I mean, nobody nobody can nobody sets out to buy energy they buy services and the more convenient they are the better and i suppose i if i was answering the question i think we're in a phase where 
um, retailers and regulators are letting people play in the electricity sector to find out what might work. And if something really does work, um, it will be retailers that will pick that up. They'll buy the software company. They'll uh, do the service themselves. They'll offer it as standard. And, and I did want to prompt um, Lynn at some point to comment on Texas, um, you know, because Texas tells us one thing, you know, it tells us people aren't, if you, if you were exposed to real time energy prices, you were a bit dumb. Um, if you are a if you're a householder, you know, it really wasn't worth the risk. Um, and you should have had a, you know, a, a, a flatter electricity contract. Um, so uh, but but maybe Lynn has a different view about that. Um, anyway, that, that'll leave it there for now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it had to come up. So let's get it out of the way. Lynn, please tell let's us about Texas away. and then we go to Xenia. <laughs> yeah, I. Um, yeah. I, I think it's important to have real-time price contracts available in the market, just as a matter of, of consumer choice and consumer empowerment. Uh, one thing I don't know about the Texas, uh, and, and just for context, you know, Texas is a very large state. I don't know how many millions of, of consumers there are there, but uh, only 29,000 people are on the real-time price contract where the wholesale price gets passed through in real time and they're unhedged. So, so we're talking about a, a fairly small portion of the market. It's a niche product. And I'm, I'm probably more inclined to, uh, to be, um, you know, because I think it's important for consumer choice and consumer empowerment, as well as for incentive compatibility in both the retail and the wholesale market to, to keep the kind of market uh, discipline there. Um, the, uh, and and um, one thing that's interesting, and, and Michael being in the UK will, will probably appreciate this, there's a company called Octopus Energy and they have a um, US affiliate that's in Texas, that operates in Texas. And they announced yesterday that they are going to rebate all of their real-time customers uh, the, the cost to them above the average price. So the average price during the, the um, blackout period was 12.2 cents per kilowatt hour. And so they're rebating them the difference, uh, which is a sizable amount. Um, but I think the, the, the you know, there's got, there's got to be some attention to both um, on the, the kind of consumer protection and competition side, um, what kind of information are the retailers providing to consumers to enable them to be fully informed when they choose such risky product projects? You know, is there like a neon light that they have to flash says warning, this is a risky project product. Um, but at the same time, on that unhedged real-time product, those consumers get access to in some hours, negative prices. So, you know, it's weighing, weighing that cost and benefit uh, is something that I think we're gonna have a lot of conversations about as we, um, as we analyze what happened. Thank you, Lynn. Xenia, how did you find the poll? Surprising or in line um, with your thoughts? <laughs> actually, really happy with the with the polls results, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks uh, a lot to uh, Leo and team for the for the invitation and the uh, introduction to this exciting topic. Uh, there's been also quite a bit of my research popped up <laughs> on the slides, so it was um, also always nice to see that the 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 topic is actually topical. <laughs> so I would like to really just. Uh, go through those individual stakeholders and a little bit um, ponder with um, together with uh, with you what were probably the reasons of the audience for these choices. Um, first of all, with the uh, uh, utilities, I, I think it is and let's say an unsurprising result that there is uh, quite a sizable share of the participants that chose that option. Um, that points um, on the one hand to the fact that um, people are by nature conservative, you know, and we, we like our established ways and it's, it's, it's kind of expectable, expected that if things work this way, they will also uh, will likely work similarly in the future. So this is why I think many people really 
let's say, put a lot of faith in the in retailers. And at the same time, obviously, they have the biggest advantage, let's say, due to their longstanding consumer relations. So obviously, who does the consumer trust more, let's say, an established retailer or uh, a completely new face on the market that may disappear next uh, next year, you know. Um, so that is understandable. At the same time, we can see that the fact that the, for example, technology companies got pri like slightest priority in the poll also um, shows a little bit of this skepticism, right? And at the same time, the uh, recognition of the need for innovation in the sector. And um, there, of course, technology providers are much more lean, more agile, and due to their focus, let's say more on this, uh, you know, innovative service um, part of business and rather than consumer relations, they can of course come up with those um, solutions much faster in a more flexible way. Um, and finally, independent aggregators and in, among the commercial actors, let's say, um, it's, um, I'm, I'm always happy to see that uh, at least the participants in this poll, but um, others also recognize a lot of value of aggregators are also um, having researched them for a while, have seen how much value they've really and innovation they brought to the market and uh, opened um, new opportunities for a lot of um, small scale providers. This is an important, extremely important role in the current context. But at the same time, um, I also saw a few um, interesting things, let's say going back to reality, what it actually means for independent aggregators. So in the in uh, a book chapter uh, that I uh, that I wrote in the in well the book that you also wrote it, um, a chapter actually in <laughs> uh, that was edited by Pierre Sirchancy uh, last year on uh, behind the meter challenges and opportunities. Um, I investigated the business models of 26 European aggregators and uh, saw that um, I think nine or ten of them were already owned by a different company, most, like, mostly utilities. So that really tell, shows you a little bit of this trend of consolidation of business, right? It's that the, the incumbents also try to, you know, not to lose their seat on the bandwagon and let's say um, still try to innovate, but maybe not through like in-house solutions, but rather through those um, acquisitions, strategic acquisitions. So this is point one. And point two, uh, also uh, quite, telling is that for now, really residential demand response is an extremely niche thing. And if you think about it, um, the last data that I have is unfortunately from 2017, but back then already we had in the EU in total about 18 gigawatt of aggregated, um, small scale aggregated assets, which is a fairly tangible number, you know, uh, but at the same time, only about five gigawatt of that were um, demand side and 99% of that five gigawatt was industrial assets. So tells you that really right now for aggregators is really um, residential customers are not an easy business. And of course, on the one hand, it depends on these, you know, the, 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 the conflicts that might um, arise with the, for example, in the relation to um, uh, as Tim mentioned, the consumer supplier were also balanced responsible parties if we talk about imbalances. Um, but at the same time, it's also a really high transaction cost. And when there are other aspects that come into play, such as, for example, network tariffs, um, it's not an easy thing to really offer a little bit of an edge there. Hmm. And with that, I, um, my, my main um, or my personal answer to this question would actually be that I believe in the future, the most feasible setup will be utilities working in collaboration with aggregators and technology providers, because they do add a little bit of an, you know, a, a different, they cover a little bit of a different aspect of the whole thing, rounding it off. And this is why I think in the future, it will be even more important to have those strategic partnerships that we already to some extent see right now, uh, like for example, for suppliers and aggregators that have some sort of a white label software that they can order and then partner. Um, it's also different, for example, on the geographical level. So we can say, for example, oh, there is an um, independent aggregator that acts 
as itself in one country, but then in another country, since they're not really well known, so difficult to get a consumer on board, they would partner with the supplier. So these ones, I think, are much more promising models right now. Mm -hmm. And probably just the final point on the on the consumers, um, the skepticism is, I think, uh, also fairly self-explanatory. And um, I believe that they're really, we still, I mean, we work in this sector. So I think we have a really skewed perception of what it really, is, what is really going on out there. But I think Michael really uh, summarized, like it gave a little bit of a sober picture of what is going on on the consumer side. I fully agree with that. And uh, they are an example that startled me really when I found that out. Um, we would think, or at least I would think, supplier switching as a kind of, a completely fully ingrained, you know, consumer right um, would be known to everybody. And then uh, was, um, I was um, uh, researching Spain and found out that only about 10% of the entire population even were aware of the fact that they can switch a supplier at all. So what are we talking about, you know? So this, um, uh, it also tells you that there is still a long way to go and there needs to be someone to really push it forward. And I think those strategic partnerships will increasingly play um, an important role. Thank you, Xenia. Um, I th you triggered a few questions. So uh, first, let me already answer uh, the first question uh, by Ali. We will share the slides. After this event, you will get um, a summary of the discussion plus the slides and the recording. Um, then, Xenia, if you could uh, add the reference to the to the number you quoted on 18 gigawatt, that would be great. Um, and then we have a question that's maybe for all of you. So these acquisitions, so both Michael and Xenia said the retailers will, you know, get into this innovative business at some point. Uh, but Pierre is challenging that more rosy positive view by saying, are these acquisitions not to kill the innovation rather than to you know, mainstream and adopt the innovation. So do you share that concern or not? Um, maybe to, to address the, 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 first, uh, um, the first request quickly. Um, so the number comes from, the, uh, from IEA's uh, World Energy Outlook. And I think that was World Energy Outlook for 2019. And so back then they had 2017 numbers. So, but you can find updated numbers in, in the, World Energy Outlook. And to the question, um, when I first um, analyzed those aggregators in Europe um, and I saw that they are getting constantly acquired by, by someone else, I was uh, personally annoyed, <laughs> but that was more of a personal reaction really than, um, than uh, anything else. Because I think, or at least now in hindsight, I believe that the more important thing is to keep the innovation going who the innovation exactly comes from is, um, is secondary. What uh, I do believe is, is crucial is that um, there, is still, there are still more market actors coming into the market. So really just having an environment that facilitates new entrants challenging, challenging the incumbents. And I think we already see that. And I think this is really the most important and the most positive, positive part. Thank you, Xenia. Yeah, Michael, go ahead. I mean, m markets are like this, aren't they? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think why would we expect electricity to be different? You know, there are startups, they've got good ideas. Why wouldn't incumbents take them over? And that's good if they can scale their business. And of course, we've, we've seen that already, haven't we, with, you know, mergers between generators and suppliers in Europe, mergers between, you know, suppliers can, can uh, creating trading businesses, moving from electricity over to gas. I mean, you know, these have all been good developments uh, and we, you know, we need to keep focused on what really matters is competition in the number of retailers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and we've had phases in the British market where um, actually there's been integration. Then we've had, you know, then we've had more recently a very positive experience with stat more standalone retailers coming into the market. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I mean, it's, it's too early to get worried about the, the sort of Facebook question, isn't it? Or Microsoft, um, 
it's, we're still not at the stage where this is really anti-competitive behavior going on. Thank you, Michael. Lini, you agree, I see. Um, okay, let's go to the second poll because I'm pretty, I'm really curious also what the audience thinks and what our panelists think. So the second poll is uh, Tim looking back on these phases said so far, what we mainly did, you know, is to remove obstacles, right? So we uh, regulation had to evolve to welcome these new entrants and we were always very positive and these new entrants were very good. And so they were very welcome. So let's remove obstacles. Um, do we think with this new phase of this new type of smart device players coming in that that is still the case? So is the dominant view that we should continue to remove obstacles? And uh, so is that the more positive role for uh, regulators or should regulators also be concerned that there might be new issues, as Tim suggested? Um, lock-in or uh, contract issues or um, so should we also have new protection regulation against these new players um, in the fourth phase or do you think we already have uh, uh, anticipated all of this in the EU clean energy package uh, so if we just implement what we have we, we are fine <laughs> okay Here's the result. So you're, you know, people want, want to, to regulation to evolve. That's clear. <laughs> uh, but half of us have a more positive view and half of us are a bit worried. So want to have more protection. Uh, that's nice. Xenia, maybe this time you go first. Sure, we'll be happy to. I am um, honestly slightly surprised by the, by the result of the poll, not by the 2% or one person who chose no changes needed. Is that a regulator, I wonder? <laughs> 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 um, but uh, a little bit by the fact that uh, people really believe that new regulation, uh, new regulation is needed. Again, I'm, I, um, I like uh, seeing things in a, in a little bit in a, in a system, right? And I think here that it's important to ask which perspective we're, 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 we're looking at it from. So um, in general, we are now really in a system that is evolving so fast that it is with all my respect and admiration for uh, regulators uh, and the, the job that they're doing, uh, no matter how smart a regulator is, he will or he or she will never come up with all the contingencies that might occur in a such a fast moving mechanism, you know, when there's so many moving parts, so many different stakeholders, it's, uh, it's, it's insane. So I think um, in such a situation, regulation will always be a little bit of a trial and error process, right? And we cannot really expect some sort of a perfect regulation that really, uh, you know, accounted for everything and that always uh, kind of uh, or manages fully to look out for everybody's in, um, in, interest because it's really a little bit of an exercise in, in squaring the circle. Um, so from that perspective, um, either of these two options, I think, are, are fully viable. And of course, adaptations are needed as long as um, you know, the, the, the system evolves. But at the same time, I think what really probably is important to consider is that um, clean energy package uh, for all Europeans, so the main really legislative package that we have right now in the EU, has been um, um, really this mammoth exercise in really covering so many things. And I, I, you know, it's called fully clean energy package for all Europeans. I would call it uh, mar market access for all Europeans package because it really has this uh, very um, strong, strong uh, preface of every technology and every type of actor is supposed to be able to act on the market. So this is really already a really strong requirement and a lot of things that have already been covered there, but not really how. So I think those, let's say this implementing regulation, right? So for example, how we have for network codes where the, you know, the regulation comes out and after that the TSOs have to propose an implementation plan and then it goes to regulators. So something like that is needed for other aspects as well, right? So that we get a little bit of more detail 
of um, how the things should be working. But again, it's a difficult um, balance to strike between giving sufficient guidance so that you avoid those regulatory gray zones, but at the same time, so that the regulation itself does not turn into some sort of a straight jacket where you, know, you will um, then um, stymie innovation as a result. So I think this is a quite difficult thing. And finally, for the new regulation, I think really, particularly with the new technologies and new types of actors coming up with uh, new business models, I believe it is, so regulatory, regulatory oversight is in any case uh, an extremely important aspect, particularly when it comes to consumer protection. Because uh, as I said before, a very, very, very a small share of consumers are really aware of all the connections and what they can really get and who bears the risk, for example, in those uh, Texas-like situations. So I think there it's really important to have those regulations in place that fully protect the consumers and particularly vulnerable consumers. Thank you, Xenia. Lynn, I already saw you wanted to intervene. Yeah, I, I really, I wanna am amplify, uh, especially the, the first part of, of Ksenia's comment, what I guess I would think of as, as kind of the market epistemology of this, right? Who knows, who knows what? And, and that um, I think it, it's, it can't be said often enough that uh, you know, regulators or, or any kind of, even, even a, you know, a central market operator uh, is never going to be able to amass the distributed decentralized knowledge that all of the different participants in markets bring to bear when they're making decisions. And so when we, you know, I think about that as kind of a top priority regulatory design principle that uh, I would summarize as simple rules for complex systems. Mm -hmm. And that if we keep, if we keep the rules transparent and clear and simple, uh, and focused on things like lowering transaction costs, lowering entry barriers, uh, consumer protection, particularly for vulnerable consumers, but in a way that still allows incentives to happen and doesn't introduce moral hazard. You know, if we have the types of consumer protection where, okay, if you sign up for an unhedged retail product, but then you're going to get repaid everything that is deemed excessive that's just going to introduce moral hazard and that's, that's counterproductive. So, um, and I, and, and this is, is increasingly, I think going to be an issue when we think about regulatory design because of what, uh, what Ksenia described and what tech policy people call the pacing problem, that the pace of innovation always outstrips the pace of regulatory change. Uh, and that, has sort of pros and cons associated with it, uh, but that we should definitely be aware of that when we're thinking about regulatory design. Thank you, Lynn. Michael? Yeah, well, again, I mean, I, I'd want to inject a bit of realism in here. You know, the electricity sector has been regulated for more than 100 years, um, and there are very, very good reasons for that. Um, and we, you know, de full deregulation of complex products hasn't got a good press recently. Um, I think one thinks of financial services, but, um, you know, there will be a lot of fallout from Texas. Yeah, I mean, yet again. So the idea that we, you know, we're going to have unfettered contracting in electricity for really quite a small measured benefit. I, I mean, I don't think politicians or regulators are going to put up with that. And I don't think they should. You know, I don't think the electricity system should be a plaything of experimentation because none of these things, even in the best case scenario, are going to deliver much value. You know, even if you cut out all transaction costs in the electricity system, it's still only a max a few percent, you know, a max. Um, you know, this, there's no upside. You know, this isn't, this isn't IT. This isn't Netflix. This isn't Facebook. This is just about cutting costs of, of delivery of energy. Um, so one need, needs to not lose sight of that. And I think, so we, you know, regulation just needs to adapt. It, I, I think, you know, people who say things are moving faster than ever before, I, I actually just put up figures of, you know, electrification rates in the UK from 1920 to 1963. You know, electricity growth grew at 9% per annum for 43 years. Now it's, it's contracting, 
So, you know, it's a joke to say it's it's changing faster than ever before relative to the past, you know, and digitalization in energy is going to lag digitalization in many other sectors quite rightly. Um, so uh, I think it, we rightly should be cautious about letting people loose on the electricity system. Uh, but that's not to say that we shouldn't, you know, get rid of rules on participation, which are clearly arbitrary, like like size thresholds or not letting uh, EVs particip EV fleets participate in the market or large scale storage. Um, but that's a very different thing from saying anybody can issue any contract without any reference to the regulator. I mean, I, I really don't think that is a good idea. Um, I think all contracts need to be approved at some level by the regulatory system. Um, so, um, so I would be much more, you need to convince me that this is going to add much value. And I haven't seen anything that convinces me that it is going to add much value in aggregate, even though, you know, a small bit of technology might pay for itself. Thank you, Michael. Let me then start by picking up some more questions, because uh, meanwhile, the audience is activated by everything you said, and you already have a few compliments also in the chat box. Um, so maybe I pick up first on, on Lisa. Um, so Lisa says, uh, you know, should we do some safety new regulations to guarantee safety with new experiments first? Or are you rather relaxed of the ongoing experiments um, and can we, f if things go wrong, then introduce new uh, regulations? I don't know if you are even aware of current new players doing things really badly, um, Xenia? Okay, this really touched the chord, I have to say, because um, so there is already a, um, a concept in, in place, it's called in different, uh, differently, in, uh, in different uh, countries um, across the world. Um, the concept is uh, um, experimental regulation or experimental um, sandboxes or regulatory sandboxes, they're also called. So this is really that, um, uh, this is where the regulators actually already ask themselves, so what do we do about this, re uh, this, uh, this innovation that is uh, sprouting out there um, to make sure that there is no, not much, you know, collateral damage, but at the same time that they can still try things out. And uh, the only things that, the, the few mentions that we have about that in the regulation right now or in the EU regulation is that certain things do not apply to, let's say, demo projects that test such innovative approaches. But such approaches that are experimenting with the system can only be within this, let's say, controlled environment of a demo project, research project, innovation project, whatever you want to call it. And um, the, um, the difference is that in, in different uh, leg national legislations, the approach to that um, experimental regulation is slightly different. So not every EU country allows that. Uh, for example, here in Austria, we um, introduced this clause only last year, so it's fairly recent. I also know that, for example, the Netherlands are also very active in this field, and Germany has this experimentation clause in its Energy Act. So, but it is very different from country to country. But I do not have a feeling that any regulator right now would allow something, someone to just experiment just like that, you know, and then wreak havoc on the on the system. That's definitely not gonna not gonna happen. The uh, the the only I think a much bigger danger is really those regulatory gray zones that do not really cover that field of activity specifically. And this is why it can lead to potentially some adverse effects. Okay. Claire mentioned in the chat box that there might have been an issue with nest behavior, the smart thermostat during the solar eclipse. I was not aware of that. Do, are, does anyone know this? <laughs> to be investigated, Claire. <laughs> if you have a reference, please share it with us. Um, I want to so give the- Actually, Leo, yeah, Lee, sure. um, yeah I, I am familiar with this nest story, the idea that they put out a call in 2017 when we had the eclipse in the, in September and um, that enough, you know, they said basically, do you want us to, you know, turn off your, 
your air conditioning so that you can, you know, save uh, stress on the grid because with the eclipse, there's going to be less solar production and so on. And that enough people signed up and said yes and reduced their use that they actually caused a dip in demand. And so you had the, the, the system operators had to balance, mm -hmm. you know, they had to throttle some supply to balance it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to use this as a pitch for, um, the work that I do in transactive energy, that if you instead had um, automation and par participation in local energy markets where you could program your in-home devices to submit bids for how much you're willing to pay for that particular service. Here's how much I'm willing to pay for comfort at this point. Here's how much I'm willing to pay for having my freezer uh, running at this point uh, or my water heater um, if, if you have a, a tank water heater as opposed to a just on-demand water heater. Uh, all of those are, are you know, energy consumption, um, but the, you know, the freezer and the water heater are also storage. And so you can you know, uh, benefit as a consumer by uh, saying, here's how much I'm willing to, to pay for the energy to, to have that service. And if the price goes above that, then just automatically reduce my use of that energy. And that's a much more granular, much more continuous, much more flowy way to balance and coordinate supply and demand than these very discrete calls, um, which obviously in, in emergency cases, like we saw in Texas last week, you have to make a discrete load shed call if you're the system mm -hmm. operator. But um, you know, using transactive energy is a much more fluid and flowy and elegant way to provide that coordination. Thank you, Lynn. Tim, you can close. So, I mean, you started by presenting the work in progress. You've received a lot. Now, what are you going to do with it? Uh <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean, first of all, it, it's very interesting in comments and, and thoughts, which we can definitely add in, into the paper. But I wanted to slightly provoke Michael a bit, which is always dangerous. Uh, he said um, that, yeah, the ones who had this real-time contract in Texas, actually, they were, they were suffering. They, they suffered but financially then. Uh, but if you think about it, if everybody would have gotten that contract, they probably would have not suffered. Because, I mean, it's a bit of a chicken egg. If you have very little response, then it's gonna get very bad. If every, everybody would be responding because everybody would have that contract, for each individual, it would have been way less of a financial disaster. So therefore I see that would be my, my critique on, on that point. And also you said that each consumer pays on average 2.5 euro per, per day. I mean, 10% of 2.5 euro per day, I mean, I don't care. But if there's one day where I can win 500 euro by doing something, I might be a lot more interested than, than this. And I think it might work like that if you think about these more extreme events, which won't happen every year, but, but they could happen more, more frequently than, than we're used to. So therefore I see um, you need high prices to avoid high costs, right? Something like that in order to, to start uh, this process uh, going. So that would be, be my, my maybe more naive uh, futuristic way of, of looking at it. Michael, now I have to give you the reply, right? <laughs> we, you cannot be challenged and then, okay, now it's over. <laughs> well, I mean, just to say, I think that most people don't accept that sort of bet that you've just outlined, that people aren't interested in betting one off, you know, once every 10 years or whatever. So um, I, I think... I think I would give you the counter example of the internet. And I would say, you know, we, we use the internet all the time. Nobody ever says, oh yeah, let the price vary in real time and slow my connection down if necessary. Most people don't want to be bothered thinking about it. And it's a very small group of people who want to engage with electricity pricing at the residential level, the 29,000. Um, so I, I think you're overestimating how interested people will be. And, and if everybody had been on the contract, that still wouldn't have been enough to save Texas. But they did calculate that if everybody would have had an EV and they would react it nicely, 
the dust the disaster could have been avoided yeah when you lose 30 or, gigs i'm not sure <laughs> or or if they'd been on a, a transactive uh where they autonomously their price was set so that their uh, thermostat cooled them down to even just 62 degrees Fahrenheit because there were plenty of people whose houses were at 32 degrees Fahrenheit because of the outages. So I'd say it's a, you know, how do you fail gracefully in, a, in an extreme event? I think these are very nice closing words, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that you're waking up uh, during the event. <laughs> so thank you again, all of you, for being here. Uh, thanks, Tim, for a great presentation. Thanks to the panelists and hope to see you soon for